Welcome back to our journey through history. We trust you had a splendid Christmas and New Year. Today, our exploration takes us to Pontefract Castle. Get ready to relax and immerse yourself in the fascinating documentation ahead. Pontefract Castle, nestled in the town of Pontefract, West Yorkshire, England, stands as a captivating ruin with a rich history. Legend has it that King Richard II met his end within its walls. Furthermore, this fortress played a pivotal role in the renowned sieges of the 17th century English Civil War. as we're strolling alongside the castle perched proudly on a rocky outcrop to the east of town and casting a watchful gaze over All Saints Church. The castle's history unfolds. Its origins can be traced back to approximately 1070, when Ilbert de Lacy, rewarded by William the Conqueror for his aid in the Norman conquest, initiated its construction. Despite the passage of time, echoes of earlier habitation resonate within its wall. What began as a wooden fortress gradually metamorphosed into the formidable stone structure that stands before us. The Domesday Survey of 1086 even chronicled Ilbert's castle, likely a reference to the very cornerstone we now identify as Pontefract Castle. Robert de Lacy faced a setback when he didn't support King Henry I in his struggle against his brother. As a consequence, the king confiscated the castle from the de Lacy family during the 12th century. In an attempt to reclaim the castle's honour, Roger de Lacy paid King Richard I a hefty sum of 3,000 marks for the honour of Pontefract. However, despite the payment, the king retained possession of the castle... It wasn't until 1199, with the ascent of King John to the throne, that the castle was returned to the de Lacy family. Unfortunately, Roger's reign was short-lived as he passed away in 1213, succeeded by his eldest son, John. Despite the succession, the king seized control of both Castle Donington and Pontefract Castle. The de Lacy's resided in the castle until the early 14th century, during which the splendid multi-libate donjon was constructed under their tenure. Oh, well, what a mouthful that was. Ready for another mouthful? Here goes, ha-ha, in 1311, through a marital union, the castle transitioned into the possession of the House of Lancaster's estate. Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, circa 1278 to 1322, faced a grim fate as he was beheaded just outside the castle walls, six days after his defeat at the Battle of Borough Bridge. The sentence was pronounced by King Edward II himself in the Grand Hall. This tragic event elevated the Earl to the status of a martyr, with his tomb at Pontefract Priory evolving into a revered shrine. The castle then passed into the hands of Henry, Duke of Lancaster, and subsequently to John of Gaunt, the third son of King Edward III. John of Gaunt transformed the castle into his personal residence, investing substantial sums in its enhancement. In the latter part of the 14th century, Richard II exiled Henry Bolingbroke, Duke of Hereford and son of John of Gaunt, from England. Following the death of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, in 1399, Richard II appropriated a significant portion of Bolingbroke's inheritance, 
Subsequently, Richard distributed some of the confiscated properties among his favourites, placing Pontefract Castle at risk. These circumstances prompted Bolingbroke to return to England and assert his rights to the Duchy of Lancaster and his father's estate. Shakespeare's play Richard II, Act 2, Scene 1, 277, vividly captures Bolingbroke's return as depicted in Northumberland's speech about the eight tall ship. Then thus, I have from Port Le Blanc, a bay in Brittany, received intelligence that Harry Duke of Hereford, Reynold Lord Cobham, Thomas, son and heir to the Earl of Arundel, that late broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother Archbishop, late of Canterbury, Sir John of Serpingham, Sir John Ramsden, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton, and Francis coined all these, well furnished by the Duke of Brittany with eight tall ships, 3,000 men of war, and making hither with all due expedients, and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Upon landing at Ravenspur on the Humber, Bolingbroke swiftly headed for his stronghold at Pontefract. At the time, King Richard II was away in Ireland, rendering him unable to resist Bolingbroke's advance. Expeditiously, Bolingbroke dethroned Richard and claimed the crown, ascending to the position of Henry IV. In August 1399, Richard II fell into the hands of Henry Bolingbroke's loyalists and was first confined in the Tower of London. Before Christmas of the same year, he was transferred to Pontefract Castle, making a detour via Knaresborough. There, under close watch, he remained until his passing, possibly on February the 14th. This significant event finds mention in William Shakespeare's play Richard III. Pomfret, Pomfret, oh thou bloody prison, fatal and ominous to noble peers, within the guilty closure of thy walls, Richard II here was hacked to death, and for more slander to thy dismal seat, we give thee up our gismal seat, we give thee up our guiltless blood to drink. Historical accounts present varying perspectives on Richard's demise. Some chroniclers propose that he was subjected to starvation by his captors, while alternative narratives suggest he chose self-imposed starvation. A contemporary French chronicler went as far as proposing that Richard II met a violent end through hacking, although the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography dismisses this claim as almost certainly fictitious. On June 25, 1483, at Pontefract Castle, Richard III ordered the beheading of two kin of Elizabeth Woodville, her son Sir Richard Grey and her brother Anthony Woodville, second Earl Rivers. In 1536, Thomas Darcy, 1st Baron Darcy de Darcy, the castle's custodian, surrendered Pontefract Castle to the leaders of the Pilgrimage of Grace. This movement represented a Catholic uprising from northern England opposing the reign of King Henry VIII. For this perceived act of surrender, Lord Darcy faced execution on charges of treason as King Henry VIII deemed it a betrayal.
on August 23, 1541, King Henry VIII graced Pontefract Castle with his presence during his summer royal progress of the north. Rumours circulated during his visit, claiming that Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard, engaged in her initial act of adultery with Sir Thomas Culpeper at the castle. This accusation ultimately led to her arrest and subsequent beheading at the Tower of London without a formal trial. Additionally, Mary, Queen of Scots, found lodging at the castle on January 28, 1569, as she journeyed between Weatherby and Rotherby and Rotherham. During his journey south to London, King James made a stop at Grimston Park and took the opportunity to survey Pontefract Castle on April 19, 1603. He spent the night at the Bear Inn in Doncaster. It's noteworthy that the castle was part of the joint property belonging to his wife, Anne of Denmark. At the onset of the English Civil War, Pontefract Castle was under royalist control. The initial of three sieges commenced in December 1644 and persisted until the following March. Marmaduke Langdale, 1st Baron Langdale of Home, arrived with royalist reinforcements, prompting the Parliamentarian army to retreat. The siege involved mining and artillery, resulting in significant damage, including the collapse of the Piper Tower, Following the conclusion of the first siege, the second siege of Pontefract Castle commenced on March 21, 1645. The garrison ultimately surrendered in July upon learning of Charles I's defeat at the Battle of Naseby. Parliament assumed control of the castle until June 1648, when royalists clandestinely infiltrated and seized command. Serving as a crucial stronghold for the royalists, Pontefract Castle facilitated raiding parties that harassed parliamentarians in the surrounding region. In November 1648, Oliver Cromwell orchestrated the final siege of Pontefract Castle. Following the execution of Charles I in January, an agreement was reached with Pontefract's garrison. On March 24, 1649, Colonel Morris handed over control of the castle to Major General John Lambert. Responding to appeals from the townspeople, the Grand Jury at York, and Major General Lambert, Parliament issued orders on March 27 for the total demolition, levelling to the ground, of Pontefract Castle with the materials from the castle to be sold off. The castle's eventual ruined state may have been exacerbated by piecemeal dismantling after the initial organised efforts of slighting. you can still explore the castle's 11th century cellars, originally utilised for storing military equipment during the Civil War. Scant remnants endure from what was once deemed one of the most impressive castles in Yorkshire, with only sections of the curtain wall and meticulously excavated inner walls remaining. The castle encompassed both inner and outer baileys. Among the oldest remnants are portions of a 12th century wall, the postern gate of the Piper Tower and the foundational traces of a chapel. 
The round tower, or keep's ruin, sit atop the 11th century mound. The imposing Great Gate, flanked by semicircular towers from the 14th century, featured inner and outer barbicans. Excavated chambers in the rock within the inner bailey suggest the possible location of the old wall, while the remnants of a rectangular tower mark the site of the North Bailey Gate. The castle boasts several distinctive characteristics, including a rare quatrefoil design for the donjon. Similar examples of this unique keep can be found at Clifford's Tower in York and the Chateau de Tampes in France. Another noteworthy feature is the presence of a Torre Alberena, a fortification seldom seen beyond the Iberian Peninsula. Referred to as the Swillington Tower, this detached structure was linked to the North Wall by a bridge strategically designed to enhance the defender's range of flanking fire. Management of Pontefract Castle by Wakefield Council led to the commissioning of repairs in September 2015. Undertaken by William Annalay Limited, however, the restoration efforts came to a halt in November 2016 when Annalay entered administration. Subsequently, Wakefield Council enlisted the services of Heritage Building Conservation North Lady recommencing work on the site in March 2017. A new visitor centre and cafe were unveiled in July 2017. Nevertheless, in April 2018, the council terminated its contract with the Heritage Building as Conservation North, looked due to a lack of progress since mid-March and a lack of reassurances regarding the resumption of work. On Yorkshire Day in 2019, the restoration reached completion, leading to Pontefract Castle's removal from Historic England's heritage at risk list. Pontefract Castle with its centuries, old history, has been a site of both historical intrigue and rumoured spiritual sightings. Many visitors and locals have shared tales of inexplicable phenomena and ghostly encounters within the castle's ancient walls. From eerie whispers in the corridors to shadowy figures glimpsed in the moonlit courtyards, Pontefract Castle has gained a reputation as a place where the past may linger in mysterious ways. Numerous reports suggest that certain areas of the castle, such as the atmospheric dungeons and the remnants of the Great Hall, have been the backdrop to spectral sightings. Some even claim to have encountered the ghostly presence of figures from Pontefract's storied park. Whether you're a history enthusiast or a paranormal enthusiast, a visit to Pontefract Castle may offer more than just a glimpse into the past. Keep your senses sharp and who knows, you might just experience a spiritual connection with the history that permeates this remarkable fortress. If you're planning a visit to Pontefract Castle, here's some travel information to help you get here. Don't forget to bring your camera. If you're coming by car, Pontefract Castle is conveniently accessible by car. Use the postcode WF81Q8. Or if 
you are coming by train, the nearest train station is Pontefract Monk Hill, approximately a 15-minute walk from the castle. Trains run regularly from Leeds and Wakefield. By bus, several bus services connect Pontefract with nearby towns and city. The Pontefract bus station is about a 10-minute walk from the castle. If you have a superhero suit and powers, you can fly here too. Ha ha! Let's be serious here. The nearest major airport is Leeds Bradford Airport. From the airport, you can take a train or hire a taxi to reach Pontefract walking from the town centre. If you're in Pontefract town centre, the castle is within walking distance. Simply follow the signs to Pontefract Castle and it's about a 10 to 15 minute walk. Before your visit, it's advisable to check Pontefract Castle's official website or contact Wakefield Council for the latest information on opening hours, admission fees and any special events. Enjoy your visit to Pontefract Castle. finished unravelling the mysteries of Pontefract Castle. Why not continue your adventure at our charming local shop, Heritage Heaven? Just a stroll away from the castle gates, Heritage Haven invites you to indulge in a delightful shopping experience. Discover unique treasures and souvenirs that capture the essence of Pontefract's captivating history. From medieval-inspired trinkets to exclusive castle memorabilia, our collection tells the stories etched in Pontefract's ancient walls. Take a piece of history home with you. And the friendly staff is there to share local insights and guide you through the array of treasures waiting to be uncovered. Heritage Haven where the past meets present. Make your post-castle visit complete with a visit to their shop. Don't miss out on the magic. Swing by Heritage Haven and let history accompany you on your journey. A big thank you to everyone who tuned in for this video on Pontefract Castle. We trust you found it enjoyable. Don't forget to check out our social media for more content. Until our next adventure, see you soon.